the Florida Gators and stake their claim for the national championship of the 1996. Here's Tebow, jump pass, throw it to the end zone, and a touchdown, David Nelson scores! Back down. You can stand me up at the gates of the Dropping back to throw, pops and fires the ball over the middle, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. Within 10 yards, lofting down the sideline for Johnson, and he is level. All right, it's time for our latest edition of Gator Glory, brought to you by Safe Harford Seafood, as we catch up with one of my favorite Gators, my man, Eric Red. You know, Eric, I, I was saying this earlier. When I want to introduce Eric Red, I feel like saying, my man, Eric Red. Channel my Denzel. <laughs> That's just, cause you, were all, you were always so gracious, E. You were always so talented. You always had a smile on your face. You are always a positive guy. Did that come naturally for you as you built your reputation in the early 90s at the University of Florida? Is that just who Eric Rett is, quick with a smile and a laugh? Oh, absolutely. That's me all the way. It's just that, um, it's just good energy. You know, I, 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 I can assume everybody that comes around me, I try to just let some of it rub off on, on them. And um, it just, it's a good feeling that I have. And I've always tried to be a, a very positive person, uh, you know, and, and uh, we, although it's a negative world, but um, I just, I just love that positive energy, and um, I always just take it with me wherever I go. Try to light up the room when I walk in it. All right, so Eric Red is a top 100 recruit coming out of Pembroke Pines uh, down there, MacArthur High School, I believe. You're also an all-state wrestler, but it's Gary Darnell, and before that, uh, Galen Hall are the coaches. I know you played for Spurrier, made your name, but you actually signed under that previous regime. So, you know, I, I'm curious what attracted you to Florida uh, pre-Spurrier, and then we could talk a little bit of just what the difference was when you arrived on campus and then the, the switch that was flipped by Steve Spurrier and and kind of what you felt Florida was when you left. So, you know, first of all, what led into you to choosing the Gators to begin with, you know, one coaching staff before Steve Spurrier took over? Well, first of all, the, the, the number one reason why you would go to a college is most likely the guy that's recruiting you. And um, Coach Red Anderson recruited me. And um, he was just so straight up out of all the schools that I had been to. You know, he assured me that he'll be there for four years and I don't have to worry about nothing. If I ever have a problem, he, his door is always open. And I can assure you, for me being there for the, the four years that I was there, his door was always open and he took care of all his players that he recruited. And that's, that's the greatest feeling that a, even a parent should know that that recruited that person that came to your house and sat on that couch and told you they're recruiting you. They're going to make sure you're okay. They're going to take care of you despite them not even being your coach. But that's still the person that I, I went to when I had a problem. He was always there. So. Now, now, you you went to Florida and and listen, Eric, because of probation and and other uh, reasons, the the Gators had been just kind of stumbling along at six and five. And in fact, they were six and five again. Your your red shirt freshman year. So how um, how different was it when Steve Spurrier took over that program? How did he change what the expectations were for you guys? Because he took a roster that would been six and six the year before, and right out of the gates, you know, busted out a nine win year and and shoot two years later, you guys were winning the SEC. So I just I'm curious what what magic touch coach had to get you guys all on board and playing, you know, as as great as you did. Okay, well, no, don't get it twisted now. When we was at University of Florida, we've always had a bunch of dogs there. I mean, very, very tough guys. When I came there, I've never seen so many, you know, tough guys in my life. I mean, it was a, it was a very, you know, it's a, it was a little bit unorganized, but it was a very tough. Those guys did a fantastic job of recruiting. But offensively, it was just mostly just give the ball to Emmett left, Emmett right, Emmett left, Emmett right, and just stir down the log, give it, throw a screen to Emmett or do whatever. It was just, it was just, it wasn't that um 
when Spurrier came, he helped revolutionize this this throwing the football. Although we did throw the football back in the day with Coach with with Dan Reeves, um, but um, it was just um, Coach Reeves. But it was it was completely different now, man. This thing was just like it was just wide open with Spurrier. And I remember when Coach Spurrier got there, we was in the spring of '90, and he just could not believe the talent that was on this team. And you just couldn't believe they really couldn't do nothing with this amount of talent. So we always had talent, but it was just unorganized. It was a lot of fighting going on the team. It was just, and Spurrier got there and he was like, don't worry, this offense that we have is just so potent. It's going to all come together. And man, it was just like, it, it came together. And it just goes to show you he can, in that offense that he has, it can just, Everybody shines, and he can bring out the best in in everybody. And and um and what he did, something that a lot of coaches you know still don't do this day, is that he made everybody compete. And, and the coaches they really developed, like a lot of lot of that's not a lot of developing going on in college football. Coaches really don't have that much time. A lot of developing is going on in high school, but his coaches. They really develop, and it doesn't matter if that was your coach or not. They're gonna see if if it was a offensive line coach saw me doing something wrong, what I could do better. It was nothing for him to to offer his input on what you could do better, and 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 um that's that's the difference right there. All the coaches they competed. L- look what our starting quarterback was, Shane Matthews. Shane Matthews started off maybe the fifth or sixteenth quarterback, and Coach Spurrier was like, hey, this guy's the best. He's gonna be the starter. If you would have told somebody that, they would have literally thought you was crazy, mm-hmm. because un- under the old regime, um Shane, I mean Shane wouldn't even had a chance to even compete yeah. for a starting job. He was just automatically the fifteenth quarterback, a guy that just hangs out with Kyle Morris hangs out around, but you would never know his name. On the story, hey, we're starting over. For, and a lot of coaches tell you that, that we're going to all compete, but hardly ever do they really, they, they always, the five-star guy automatically starts with the starters. Mm-mm. Not with Coach Spurrier. He makes everybody compete. And people don't realize that competition, that's what makes you great. you got to be willing to compete. These days, the minute you try to offer a guy to compete, he jumps in the transfer portal. So that's the difference right there. You know, so it's so interesting what you're saying, Eric, as we uh, bring you Gator Glory, brought to you by Safe Harbor uh, Seafood. You know, we're trying to kind of pinpoint, you know, the reason that Florida was able to turn, you know, its history, its legacy around. You know when you went there, they had never won an SEC title, much less win a national championship. And I I think your answer right there speaks to some of that. Steve Spurrier changed the standard of what was going to be expected of a Gator football player, whether you thought you were going to be a starter or thought you were going to be fifth string. So it's so interesting to hear you say that. Let me ask you this. You knew Steve Spurrier coming in was known for his – passing game wizardry was there a part of you as a running back who was a little nervous that perhaps that position wouldn't be featured as much as you thought it would when you came you know on the heels of Emmett Smith to Gainesville oh absolutely I I thought that I would immediately have to transfer although I did come to University of Florida on a defensive scholarship oh wow but um look at that I I quick I quickly did I I just wasn't defense was like kissing my sister (laughs) I just just could not get a kick out of defense (laughs) I felt the greatest the best guys play offense yeah so um I I I wanted to play offense so bad although I was you know projected probably even play a lot faster on defense it was just offense was where it was to me yeah so um um but um you know when, when Spurrier came here man we like I say we had some serious recruits from that image team from the 87 um 88 89 I mean my ta- my class is very small and it was probably one of the probably one of the worst recruiting class in the history of UF compared to what they have now and what they had in the past but you know image class was probably number one and um great offensive line but there was so many dogs there but Spurrier put it all together and organized the dogs where we wasn't fighting each other. We weren't going out doing crazy things. Everything just got so organized, and that's that, that's what we needed. Now it, it's that it's just that we have to. You you, you now you in a, in a, in a tough predicament right now because if you recruit a lot of the tough dog players, then you get into academia. Then you get into question about these guys fighting and stuff like that somehow or another you got to be able to get these guys recruit these guys that are just complete dogs because we have so much talent in the state of florida but 
everybody's everybody's coming out and getting some of our greatest players down here, especially in South Florida. You know, Alabama takes what they want. Clemson takes what they want. Notre Dame can get what they want. And um, Oklahoma get what they want. And, and you know, you left now. <laughs> the, the three top-notch schools really don't get the – top-notch recruits, you know, and the stuff that you got to sell these guys with was unreal. But, you know, we, we, we had one guy. We didn't have a knock, but we had that one guy that was recruiting out here, Coach Red Anderson, and he did such a good job. And the one thing he was, he was just straight-up honest. Yeah. You know, he let you know that you will have to compete. It is Was it the right – I know Spurrier, uh, Coach, put a lot into the Georgia rivalry. That plays back to when he was getting his head beat in as a player. But it seemed – Being a Florida grad myself, covering the Gators at that time, it seemed that those early 90s, it felt like Florida State was your top rival. Can you just talk about the intensity of that rivalry when you were there? And would you agree, looking back, that that was the game that really got the juices flowing more than any other? Yes, it did get the juices going for us, the younger generation. But the older generation, you know, Florida State was just another game. To them, it was always the Florida-Georgia game. That was the one that meant so much to them. But us, man, it was all about competing against um, um, Florida State because they just they had just as much talent as we did, if not more. I mean, and, they, and, they, and, and these guys, all of us are from the same area, where there's Pensacola, it's from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, everybody with Tampa, all that, everybody just competed. And we've always competed against each other from Little League all the way to the junior high. So we all know each other. So that that's what made that rivalry so much fun. But um, once again, the older generation, guys that were born like in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they was all about, all yeah. about the Florida-Georgia rivalry. That's the, that's the, that's the biggest rivalry right there. All right, so. you, had, you had so many moments at the <laughs> University of Florida, Eric. You're the, you're the school's all-time leading rusher. Not our man Fred Taylor, not Emerson. No, it's Eric Red who still maintains that, the only guy to go over 4,000 yards. So I'm going to pick out three, and I'm doing this like on the fly, no research. I'm going to pick out the three Eric Rhett moments that I remember when you were at the University of Florida. And then you tell me if they're in your top three and if not, where I missed, okay? Okay, All go right. ahead. One, to me, was that, that, that mud fest against the dogs. You had to carry it 100 times that day. You ran for like 170 yards. Florida beat Georgia, and you just, they just keep, kept handing it to you. That stands out to me as a top three Eric Rhett uh, moment. Does that make your list? Yes. Okay. What do you remember about that day? Oh, oh, so, okay, I thought you were going to give me three more. Well, okay. well, oh, we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do them one at a time. I'm going to give you that one first. You say that makes the list, so let you tell me. Oh, man. T- tell me why. What, that, that, that day right there, it was so muddy that Gosh. day. And I tell you, man, it's like, um, you know, that right there is called, that, I call that the red zone. When, when you just in that zone, and every person in life, I tell you, man, every person in life, they're going to one day get in that zone. Whether they're in business, they're in sports or whatever, it's nothing like being in your own zone yeah. where nobody can stop you, no matter what. you. I, I can recall Spurrier calling the plays, and the plays, were, our plays was very simple. It was 34 to the right, 35 to the left, Panther, Panther 12 to the, to the right, Panther 13 to the left. And the defense can actually see the plays and they can say, hey, he's coming right here, coming right here. But they give me the ball and you still couldn't stop me for seven, eight, ten yards. And it was just, it's it's one of those days when you're in the zone and everybody's slipping and falling down. And it's like I'm the only one that has traction on my shoes. So it was just, <laughs> it's, like, it's like a once in a lifetime moment where you just get in that zone. But the play came down to the last play of the game. Yeah, the timeout game, that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the timeout. <laughs> Anton Lott called that time out and it's just like man I remember it just you know it's not a day go by almost um almost almost it's 28 years ago and not a day go by and I'm in South Florida where someone mm-hmm. doesn't say hey I remember that Georgia game yeah. I was at All that right. Georgia game alright good I nailed man. that one I'll give you a second yeah. one I think I'm going to get right on this one too I, I think you also you must have liked the, the, the field here because you also came back in a in a Gator Bowl game. Was it NC State in the fog? And again, they handed you the yes. ball a thousand times. You must have carried it 40 times that night, I believe, set the Gator Bowl <laughs> rushing record. I don't know if that still stands. So does that yeah. crack the does that crack the Eric Rett personal top three? Well, you know, that, that was a game that went by just so fast. And um, we didn't we, – we were there. It was more like our bodies was there, but our spirits weren't there. Yeah. Because, like, you know, we yeah. knew – 
Yeah, we knew that we a way better team than, than <laughs> North Carolina State. And we're like, what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing in Jacksonville? We just lost a heartbreaker yeah. to um to Alabama. And it's like, man, we should be at the Sugar Bowl. So, you know, let's just let's take it out on North Carolina. Since they think <laughs> they could come roll with us, let's just take it out on and unfortunately the, the, the entire fans in the stands and on television, they couldn't see the game yeah, because like the that. game was completely – and it looked like I was in another red zone where it seemed like I, I was the only one that could see that, <laughs> <laughs> that could block out – I had the fog lights on. Yeah. So I could block out the fog, you know, but it was a – that 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 was that was that was a great game right there. But um, I don't know if that makes my top okay, three. Good. But it was an independent, you know, I, pretty I, good game. You I, know, I, I'm gonna give you one more. It's not necessarily like the first two. I concentrate on these high volume games. This other one is just kind of a nuance to the attack, but it stands out. You stand out to me on this, and I think it may be the first time in in my history of watching covering football that I saw this play. And I I want to say you busted it out for the first time in the SEC championship game. I could be wrong. Maybe it happened late in the year before that. But it was the old, basically like a delayed draw. He would play action, fake it to Eric Rett, and then when he got to the line of scrimmage, Shane would do that little underhand shovel scoop to you. So in effect, it was like yeah. half draw play and and half play action pass but I associate that play with you and I remember how well it worked against that unbelievable Alabama defense in on that SEC championship Saturday uh, do you recall that play as being something innovative oh yeah that that, that, that that was definitely makes the innovative list right there yeah coach Spurrier knew that we had two freshman offensive tackles and he was like I, how do you compete against two all American guys that are going in the top ten picks in the NFL drive draft and we have two freshmen. These guys were getting up field so fast up and around our tack- uh, most tackles. We was like, we gotta do something. That's when he implemented that play right there underneath where um the little shovel pass, mm-hmm. shovel pass um twelve, shovel pass thirteen. I just stand right next to Shane, I act like I'm blocking, and then I turn around as he's as he's going back for a pass, he go in and flips it. That play is actually a a throw. That's actually a pass. Yeah. It's not a handoff. It's actually it go down as a pass, and um, they could not stop it. And I talked to Gene Stallings many years ago, and he was like, "Man, I don't know how Spurrier came up with that creative play right there." I was like, well, "He was like, what in the hell is Spurrier got up? LT <laughs> got up his sleeve, and that play right there helped us compete with them yeah. because." It, Man, I, I, that was one defense where, like, I thought I had got used to all the hits that night. But they, that defense was coming. And actually, man, they was trying to really give us payback from the year before. We actually beat them really bad. 45 to nothing or something like yeah, that. We yeah, we used to smoke Alabama when I played. Alabama was, they, they, it was just another team. We would really smoke them. And um, it, we only lost to them one time when I was there. Yep. It's Gator Glory. It's presented by Safe Harbor uh, Seafood. And Eric Red, you're the reason we do this uh, feature. It's been great catching up with you. My man, Eric Red, who was so important to uh, the University of Florida football program, it evolving into to what it uh, became. So, E, thanks for taking some time and catching up with us today. Continued success uh, with all the work you do off the field. And we'll catch up with you down the line. All right. Thank you, buddy. Go Gators. Hey, baby.